Ever heard of the term hermeneutics? It's a funny sounding word, isn't it? Welcome to Through the Bible. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, and today our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee, explains the importance of hermeneutics, which is the word theologians use to describe the science and art of interpreting the Bible. Also, in our time together, Dr. McGee shares one of his golden rules of scripture interpretation. That's all ahead as we continue our study of Hebrews in chapter 3. It's going to be a great one, and I know that you're going to enjoy it, and we'll all be learning something, so stay with us. Well, December is letter month. It's a favorite time for us to give special attention to your letters, your texts and emails, as well as your Facebook posts. However you choose to write, we're always glad to hear from you. So let's share a few notes that we've recently received. I think that you'll really be encouraged. I know I certainly have been. First, we've got an email from Sharon in Winchester, Virginia. What a great blessing it is to participate with the special part of the body of Christ that prays daily under the banner of World Prayer Team. Way to go, Sharon. We may all be members of a local church, a Bible study, a community group, or various small groups, but there is something very special about praying around the world with the other Through the Bible listeners. I know that when I think about and pray daily for the different people groups and individuals who are spoken of in the emails, I'm joining a powerful, unseen group of saints who stand boldly at the throne of grace, seeking God's mercy for the whole world, one nation, one person at a time. It is a joy to consider that wonderful day when we all get to meet each other in heaven, where we will come face to face with our glorious Savior and King. What a blessing it'll be to shake hands with the great believers who are waiting to greet us, like the Apostle Paul and Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Thanks for your faithfulness to the mission set before you so long ago to take the whole word to the whole world and to share the needs and praises of the family of God with the World Prayer Team. Well, thanks so much for writing, Sharon, and I agree. There is something so special about praying as a team member as we together take God's whole word to the whole world. And then our last letter comes to us from a young woman in Santa Ana, California. I've been full of resentment lately and continue to complain to God, asking Him for a better job and different life. In hopes of lifting my mood, I began to listen to Christian broadcasts. Dr. McGee's voice caught my attention, and despite the fact that he sounded too old-fashioned for me, I still listened. After the first program, I was captivated by his down-to-earth teaching, humor, and love for our Lord Jesus. Needless to say, I am now a regular listener and have found that God's Word is dramatically changing my heart. One day I hope to meet Dr. McGee in heaven and thank him personally. But for now, I want to thank those of you who continue these broadcasts. You make the Bible easier for me to understand. Well, if you liked hearing these stories about how God is working in the lives of of our fellow Bible bus travelers, please write and tell us your story. It's letter month, and we really do want to hear from you. You can email us at biblebus at ttb.org or write to us at P.O. Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109, in Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1, and share your thoughts today. Well, now it's time to begin our study, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of studying your Word Please touch our hearts and open our minds so that we may know you better. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's Through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come to the third chapter of the epistle to the Hebrews, and the subject here is Christ is superior to Moses. We have seen that he's superior to the prophets, and we've just concluded the section where we've seen he's superior to angels. Now, having said that, in chapter 3, he begins, Wherefore? And this is another reason I feel Paul is the writer of this epistle. As we said when we were in the epistle to the Romans, Paul uses wherefore and therefore as a sort of a hinge or a cement to present that which is logical. Now, the wherefore is even more than that. The wherefore is to me like a hinge on a swinging door. It go back and forth both ways. Or it can be looked at as a marker when you come in on a freeway or come in on a main thoroughfare. The warning is look both ways. Look 
this way and that way. And wherefore looks back at what he's already said and looks forward to what he's going to say. So he begins with wherefore, holy brethren. And I'm just taking these expressions up now as we come to them. Brethren would mean those that were Hebrews like Paul. Paul was after the flesh, a Hebrew, and he called them his brethren after the flesh that were believers. And they're holy, not because of what they do, but because of the fact that the word actually means separated. They are separated unto God. They belong to him now, holy brethren. And then he says, partakers of the heavenly calling. Now, the nation Israel had an earthly calling. All the promises in the Old Testament to the nation Israel had to do with this earth. He promised them rain from heaven. He promised them the fertility of the soil, bountiful crops. And those blessings were physical blessings, although they are spiritual. Today, the idea that anything physical can't be used in a spiritual way is wrong. And that's one reason that people don't like to have money mentioned in church. Well, what's wrong with it? Money can be used in a spiritual way. It's not very impressive to hear somebody pray for something and then not back it up with their pocketbook. If you're going to pray for missions, I would suggest you give to missions if you want to make your prayer effective because all that your prayer is is nothing in the world but just a lot of wind escaping. That's all. It's spiritual to give. That's one of the things that a priest does offers up spiritual sacrifices. Giving is one of them. Praise of our lips is something else, too. Now, when we say here, partakers of the heavenly calling, these are the brethren that had an earthly calling, but they have come up to date. They belong now to the now generation of those of Israel that have turned to Christ. We've moved into a different age. The writer to the Hebrews is going to make that very clear to them that uh, offer sacrifices yesterday in the past was according to the Mosaic system, and it was right. But now it's wrong because it's all been fulfilled in Christ, and now you have a heavenly calling. The earthly calling hasn't disappeared, but the earthly calling now has been changed for the heavenly calling so that they are partakers of the heavenly calling. That is something that several Jewish missionaries in Israel tried to make clear to us today in witnessing to a Jew. We give the impression that he's got to cease being a Jew. I don't know why we got in that habit, but we are in that habit. Man still be a Jew, be a child of God. He now has a heavenly calling. We don't cease being what we are when we become a child of God. If we are a German or an Englishman or a Frenchman or an Italian, we're still that, and nobody's asked us to give that up. And the Jew is still a Jew. He's now come to Christ. He's moved along with the revelation of God, and he's partaker now of the heavenly calling. That's important to see that the epistle to the Hebrews becomes almost meaningless if you don't consider the fact to whom it's written and when it was written. Someone sent me John Wycliffe's golden rule of interpretation. Now, John Wycliffe lived from 1324 to 1384. That was way back. And here was what he gave as the golden rule of interpretation and I still think it's gold and not tarnished at all. Listen to it. It shall greatly help ye to understand Scripture if thou mark not only what is spoken or written, but of whom and to whom, with what words, at what time, where, to what intent, with what circumstances, considering what goeth before and what followeth. My friend, you can't improve on that one. If you'll just take that rule of John Wycliffe and apply it to Hebrews, I don't think we'll get in any trouble at all. Partakers of the heavenly calling, that would be perfectly meaningless apart from these Hebrew Christians. 
Now, notice what he says. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, and I'd like to change the word profession to confession, Christ Jesus. Now, the word for Christ is not in the better manuscripts, and I think that some of the newer translations have made that clear. For that reason, I'd like to read it like this now. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, that which we confess, Jesus. It's Jesus. Now, we're told to consider him. Now, this word here for consider is a very important word. It has in it the idea of the fact that we are to give faithful attention to this. We are to consider this in the fact that we are to give time to it. Very frankly, this is a very important statement that we have here. Consider. Spend your time thinking about him. Consider him. It's a very significant word, and it's one that we ought to recognize that it means careful, careful thought, and serious attention. It is one that we should spend a little time with. Now, he says, consider the apostle. The Lord Jesus was an apostle, and that's in the very various meaning of the word. Now, what does it mean? I don't think we need to read anything into this word at all. After all, what is an apostle? It's one who's sent. Consider the apostle. He was sent from God to this world. He's God's messenger. He's the revelation of God. Consider him. Now he comes from God to man as an apostle. But he says, consider the apostle and high priest. Now that's going to be the subject of this epistle. And for the moment, the writer to the Hebrews will omit it. And then when he comes back to it, that's all he's going to talk about. And we'll have to wait till we get to the fifth chapter to see that. But let me say this at this point. We have a high priest. We're to consider him. And a high priest is going the opposite direction from an apostle. Now, an apostle is coming from God to man with a message. That was a prophet. The prophet spoke for God to man. But a high priest, he's going on the other side of the freeway in the opposite direction. He's coming from man to God. He represents man before God. Now, he is our high priest. He represents us before God. And who is he? It's Jesus. Jesus, the man, Christ Jesus. Jesus, the emphasis is upon his humanity. Again, I want to say this. There's a man in the glory today, friend. And he represents us up there. I am very happy he's up there because we're told that he is an advocate for us. He defends us. He's on our side. He understands us. He understands me as no one understands me. I feel like sometime that when I talk to somebody and try to make something clear to them, I don't quite make it clear. I tried to explain to an audience some time ago the feeling I had when I was told I had cancer. And I saw, after I talked a couple of minutes, that I wasn't getting through it all. They didn't really understand my feeling. But you know, Jesus understands exactly how I felt. And he understands how you feel. And we're to consider this. We are to give serious thought to this, friends, and careful attention. We've got an apostle. He came from God. And he's our high priest. He went into God's presence for you and for me today. That's quite a wonderful verse, as you can see. Now he's going to show that he is superior to Moses. You see, having taken up the prophets who spoke for God in the Old Testament, and having shown his superior to angels, because they gave so much attention to that, now he must show that he's superior to Moses, because Moses is very important. Several years ago, they had a debate, that is, the rabbis did, over in Denver, Colorado. Who was the greatest, Abraham or Moses? And it's my understanding that Moses 
was the one that they finally decided was the greatest. Moses was greater even than Abraham. Moses was the greatest. Now, if Jesus is to be considered, he has to be superior to Moses. Now, he's going to show that. And how is Jesus superior to Moses? We're told here that the Lord Jesus was faithful to him that appointed him. The Lord Jesus was faithful as he came down to this earth to represent God to man, and he's faithful as he represents us to God. But Moses also was faithful in all his house. Now, whose house are we talking about here? By the way, that word house occurs seven times in the next six verses. It's very important to determine whose house we're talking about. Is it Moses' house? I don't think so. He's talking about God's house. Moses was faithful in his house, that is, in God's house. Moses was called to do a certain thing, and Moses was found faithful. Now, Moses made some mistakes and wrote about them. Several years ago, a liberal went around this country, and he talked about the mistakes of Moses. It was Ingersoll, I think, And some famous preacher followed him around, and he gave a message on the mistakes of Bob Ingersoll. Well, Moses did make mistakes, but not in writing the Pentateuch. But in the Pentateuch, he tells us about some mistakes that even Moses made. You know, he shouldn't have smitten that rock as much as he did. In fact, the matter is, he shouldn't have smitten it at all the second time. Once was enough, because that rock speaks of Christ, and God was protecting that type, that picture of Christ, he was smitten once for us. Moses lost his temper. He didn't know what he was doing, and he smote the rock twice. Moses made some mistakes, but isn't it wonderful here, now that Moses' life is all past, the thing that he was noted for, he was faithful. Faithful to God. That's the thing the Lord Jesus, we're told, is going to commend his own for. That is, Faithfulness. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Faithfulness. And I tell you, I don't care who he is, a man that's not faithful to the task that he's called to do. And I'm always suspicious of a preacher who is an assistant or under a pastor and he's not faithful to him. I was holding meetings for a very wonderful preacher and he doesn't play golf but his assistant played golf. So his assistant took me out to play golf. And he took that opportunity to let me know he was very unfaithful, to tell the truth, to the pastor. He made little dirty digs, and he had a lot of things to say that he shouldn't have said. He should have been faithful to his pastor, the man he was working for. But he was disloyal to him. And so the next day he said to me, I've arranged for us to go out and play on a certain golf course. And I said, I'm sorry, I won't be able to go out today. And I never played at that man again. And the next time I went back to that church for a meeting, that man was gone. I asked the pastor about, oh, he said he got us in a lot of trouble here. I found out he was very disloyal. And I wondered at the time whether I shouldn't have told the pastor about it. I hate a disloyal preacher. <laughs> I have no use for one that's not faithful to the man that he's to serve. And I want to say today, and I know a lot of preachers are listening in, my friend, if you are not faithful to the man you're working in under, to begin with, if you can't be faithful to him, then you ought to leave. And if you're not faithful to him, you're not faithful to God. I can tell you that. You are not a man to be trusted. And I would never have trusted that assistant pastor under any circumstances. Now, the interesting thing, he wrote me after that and wanted me to recommend him to a church. I didn't recommend him. How can you recommend a man to be pastor when he was an assistant? He wasn't faithful. Moses was faithful. Moses was faithful. Wonderful to be faithful, friends. But wait just a minute. The interesting thing, the Lord Jesus Christ was faithful. All right, then. How is the Lord superior to Moses? Verse 3, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses. How? inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. Now, Moses was faithful in God's house, but the Lord Jesus is the one who built the house. You see, 
He's the creator. Moses is the creature. There is a difference, my friend. Now it says, verse 4, for every house is built by some, and the word man is in italics, been built by someone. Can't have a house unless it just didn't grow, you see. For every house is built by someone, but he that built all things is God. And the Lord Jesus is the creator. He's God. Moses never made that claim. Now will you notice verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now, there's several things very important here. Not only is Christ superior to Moses in that he is the creator and Moses is a creature, but also Moses, the best thing that could be said of him, he was a servant of God. Never is he called a son of God. Christ is the son of God. And by the way, there is a difference between the son in the house and the servant in the house. All the difference in the world. So Christ is superior to Moses here on two counts. Christ is the creator, and he is the son. Now there's something else here that's very important to see, and we're going to have time to just look at it. It says here, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Paul had a way of using ifs, not as a condition, but as a method of argument and of logic, by the way. I think what he's saying here is, since we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope to the end. In other words, if we are a son of God, if we are partakers of the heavenly calling, we will be faithful. We will hold fast. That's the proof of it. And you remember John put it like this over in 1 John 2, 19. Let me read that. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Now, I have always believed that God has permitted the cults to come along to draw out of the churches those that are not really believers. That's one way he has a strain in the proof that you are a child of God is the fact that you're faithful to God and that you hold to the faith. That doesn't make you a child of God. That's the proof you are a child of God, my friend. And if you are a child of God, you will hold out, not because you are able to, but because he's able to make you stand, therefore. So what we have here is the if of argument that you are holding out. And that means you are partaker of the heavenly calling, you see. You are among the brethren. And if you're not, you're going to move out. That's the reason I always use the Bible. It's sort of as a means of testing. When I was pastor of a church, I taught the Word of God. And when a person really is a child of God, he's going to hold to the Word of God. He's going to love the Word of God. He wants to hear his father talking to him. And I used it as a Geiger counter. You know, I just put it down on a fella. You don't get any reaction. You're almost sure it's not a child of God. Oh, he may be a church member. We've got a lot of those around today. But my friend, it's your relationship to the Word of God. Are you faithful? That is the evidence. You are a child of God. Until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. What about you? Are you faithful to His Word? Is your love and desire to read and study God's Word growing? I know from personal experience that just because you want to read and study the Bible, you may not always understand what it's saying. And that's where Through the Bible can really help. Our program, you see, is designed to take you through the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation in a five-year journey of what Dr. McGee affectionately called the Bible bus. So no matter where you live or when you join us, if you stay on the bus, you'll hear the entire Bible taught in five years. And to receive regular updates through the journey, including our monthly newsletter, you'll want to join our mailing list. It'll extend what you're learning a little further with more great teaching from Dr. McGee and faces and names to put 
with what you learn about through the Bible's global outreach. You can get it by email, or you can have it delivered to your home. To be added to our mailing list, simply visit us at ttb.org and sign up or call us today at 1-800-65-BIBLE. That's also the number that you can call to find out more about the many Bible study resources that are written and recorded by Dr. McGee. Again, the number is 1-800-652-4253. If you're enjoying our time in Hebrews and you want to continue with us as we study the supremacy of Christ, then join us tomorrow right here on Through the Bible. Until then, I'm Steve Schwetz, praying that God's Word will lead you to a deeper, sweeter walk with the Lord Jesus today. We're so grateful for the faithful and generous support of Through the Bible's partners who are being used by God to take the whole Word to the whole world.